Welcome to Reaction with me, Ian Martin, for the latest of our Author in Conversation series. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Azim Azhar, who's the author of Exponential, How Accelerating Technology is Leaving Us Behind and What to Do About It. And of course, you're the creator of Exponential View, which is a leading platform on technology in-depth analysis on on the industry and mm -hmm. what it means for the rest of us and you've got a, a widely read weekly newsletter so th so thank you for taking the um taking the time you're also you know a tech investor and 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 founder and you've written lots of uh, noteworthy publications just before we get into the book just before we started this we were talking about zoom versus the studio and which which changes in terms of how we do these these things, not just in media, but in terms of how we all work. What will survive the crisis? I'm assuming that this is going to be a really good year, positive year. I hope so. Better than the we, last two. <laughs> yeah, better than the last two, which is yeah, yeah. which yeah. is a low bar, but I think we're we're going to exceed that. Um, what do you what does the world look like afterwards? Do you think? Yeah, it's 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 hard to know. I mean, I I don't think there's a an old normal. 2019 normal that we we go back to because we have been experimenting now for for two years in this new way of life and if you think about perhaps going on a diet those people who stick to the diet for a year or a year and a half end up being slim the rest of their lives and for most of us we do three or four weeks and then we we sort of uh, fall back and in this case we've been forced into these new behavioral patterns and sitting at home and having this interview with you is a great example will I ever really go back into the office and the studio to do something like this I mean I did go to a studio last week to record mm. something it was really nice Ian I showed up someone gave me a cup of tea they sat me down I spoke for a bit and then I left and I didn't have to worry about any of the files and this and that and and it was really nice to have that that service uh, culture, which I, I think we, with all of this, a lot of this automation we've lost, right? We've ended up doing things that other businesses used to do for us. And yeah. no doubt after this recording, you will be doing something that you used to get your production company to do you know, a decade ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a similar experience last week in that, you know, as a, as a political hack, political commentator, it's been difficult to spend time at Westminster. I've you know, mm -hmm. been in and out at various points in the crisis, but you know, as a, as a Commons pass holder, I thought, right, New Year, I'm actually going to spend as much time as, as, as possible. And just last week, in the, the first couple of days in the, of the week where I could make it in, just the, the, the contrast. I mean, WhatsApp is fantastic, but just seeing, I saw so many people ran into so many ministers, MPs, advisors, just people you bumped into in the corridor and managed to have that short informal conversation about what was going on. And there's a lot going on in a way that wouldn't quite be feasible sitting at home with your laptop. And uh, so I, I think you're right, but with, but certain things will survive. I think, I, I think, you know, the, the ease of recording or recording at long distances or being able to record with an author who's on the other side of the the world and it not having to be coordinated with the necessarily the book tour which brings us to your book cool. is an advantage that will uh, that i think will survive now um tell us about the book because it it talks about something which you define as the exponential exponential gap mm -hmm. explain to our viewers and listeners how you define that what it is well, th thank you. I mean, you know, the, the book is really about the how we deal with the impacts of uh, accelerating technologies. I think we can all agree that we live in a society that is suffused with much more technology than it was 50 or 100 years ago, that it sits in between um, everything that we, we try to achieve. But there's something distinct about these technologies in that they are um, iterating and improving very, very rapidly, quite often in quite fundamental ways. You know, they're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and that means that businesses use more and more of them. But they create these new potentials that we hadn't considered before. What we're doing now, we're a high definition video conference just from our homes. Mm -hmm. And those new potentials uh, stress and strain the institutional regulatory mechanisms that make life easy and manageable you know we we forget that even if we don't really like regulation that much 
it's really helpful to know when you've got to get your taxes in. It's really helpful to know which side of the road you should drive on uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, my argument is that, you know, institutions, whether they're formal uh, ones or informal customs, always adjust. But th at this moment, the speed with which they have to adjust because the technology is changing so rapidly is much faster than anything we've seen before. And that creates the exponential gap. And the exponential gap is that mismatch between the potentials of these new technologies and customs, habits, norms, formal institutions that we have used to you know, make life easier to live for, for business people, for uh, nations and for families. So if you take a, a, a sophisticated industrial democracy, it has it developed in a certain way its style of bureaucracy in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It then that was accelerated by the arrival of business systems and then computers in the aftermath of the of the Second World um, Second World War. So that changes business and 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 government. But what's happening now? Your contention is this is this has happened very quickly over the last 20, 30 years. Mm. How on earth do you reimagine? Institu institutions. Let's start with uh, you know, start with government, but also business as well. What on, how on yeah. earth do you assess about it? Well, I, th I think one of the first things you have to do is is diagnose the uh, not just the symptoms, but the underlying processes uh, that you're having to c contend with. So let's take one example, which is uh, what uh, within industrial economics, what should we think of as um, the hallmarks of a competitive market? Uh, and that's obviously a really present question because in 2009, the tech companies started to become the largest companies in the world. And by 2015, that tr transformation has been complete. And we can look at them now and they sort of feel big and monopolistic. And yet they don't seem to pass the test for being monopolies. And, and part of the reason for that is, is that you know, the way in which we came to our, our thinking about how markets should work was predicated on this assumption that companies could only really get to a certain scale because it would be more and more complicated to manage them as they got larger, that mm. diminishing marginal returns would mean that it would be less and less profitable to get big. And so for most of our lives, with the exception of a handful of aggressive monopolists like Standard Oil that predates us, in most markets, the biggest company would have 30 or 40% market share. Now, if you look at technology markets, the biggest companies in any given market have perhaps 80, 90% share. And, and the reason is not necessarily because of uh, you know, bad behavior. It's because the, the nature of these, these technologies, the fact that they lend themselves to platforms, the fact they lend themselves to network effects means that the laws of gravity that used to hold back the size of Ford or General Motors or British Leyland don't apply to the Metas or Alphabets or Amazons uh, of today. And so if we're going to tackle that, if we're going to recognize that markets don't work well when there are super dominant players in them, then what we need to do is we need to go back and say, well, look, this super dominance falls out as a consequence of the technologies. So what kind of rules do we want to manage those to make sure that these markets are still vibrant and competitive and pro innovation and pro consumer? I mean, so that's a that, that's a big problem for government and governments around the world are struggling and the European Union as well as struggling with it with the concepts that you described very well there what mm. what are these new types of companies some of us I would put myself in this category thought as you know someone who's an admirer of Teddy Roosevelt and a lot of the stuff that was done in the early 20th century in the US the, the trust busting mm. it seemed initially as though you could apply similar regulatory models to break up these companies but that now that, that's questionable isn't it so yeah. but as this as, as, as this is happening and they're developing faster and faster and becoming more and more econ economically dominant i think they are anyway mm -hmm. um years pass and government doesn't come governments fail to come up with any kind of solution to this is there a solution well i i, I don't think there's a single solution i think there's a portfolio an inadequate patchwork uh, of things that we can start to do in ways in which we can can intervene um, and they do vary very very differently uh, from sector to sector or subsector to subsector the first thing i think that we have seen in the last few years is um, the more uh, 
diligent investigation of these firms' behaviours, and it started to identify genuine causes of concern of bad behaviour, of collusion, yeah. or of monopolistic practice. So, of course, we need to do that, and we need the the enforcement there to be very, very effective. But there's there's something about the nature of the rules. So, I do quite like a couple of ideas that are in the uh, in Europe's digital services and digital uh, markets uh, proposed uh, uh, new rules. One of which is to say, as these companies get bigger, there should be higher obligations of the, on them. Because mm. what, what essentially happens is, as they get bigger, because of network effects, they have more reasons and more capabilities to get bigger still, and therefore bigger and bigger. So we, sh we can then start to put higher obligations onto them as they get large. I mean, we don't want to go to a small company of a thousand employees and uh, and say you need the same obligations to operate as Facebook. What we want to say to Facebook is you need to have higher obligations. And in the case of Facebook, it might be um, that they need to be much more transparent and observable about the way in which they run their business and the way in which they make decisions. So instead of us looking retrospectively at why did they kick off Donald Trump or not, we should have a a way for civil society or, or, or government to be able to look at that decision making almost in real time. A second thing I think that would be really powerful, uh, and there is some legislation like this being proposed in uh, in the US called the Access Act, is to make to insist that large technology platforms have this quality of interoperability. Interoperability means that I should be able to use those services and connect to their, their customers without necessarily being using the Facebook product. And, and a simple example, you and I are of a certain age, we will remember when SMS text messages could mm. only be sent to someone on the same network as you, to CellNet, if you're a CellNet subscriber, or Orange, if you used Orange. Mm. Starting about 2001, the, the networks made their SMS messages interoperable, so you didn't have to be on the same network. And actually, it was really good for the consumer and good for the market. So interoperability is one of my favorite um, interventions when we look at you know, the, the, this question of you know, Google or Facebook or Instagram or, or Amazon. But, but it, again, it's really not straightforward because these businesses are really complicated. And they also have, as you say, as they've grown in size and they have the potential to get even to carry on getting bigger. They ha then have the sort of political power to defend themselves, don't they? So they, these aren't they're new, almost states within states. They, they are states within states and they they have the political power. They also have the wherewithal and the resources to you know, run around uh, the, the capabilities of, of the state. So we clearly need the states to have a bit more. Uh, capability. But I also think we're going to have to figure out how to coexist with them because what they what they run and operate is some of the core infrastructure for this for this new world. Yeah. Um, and so you know a really good example will will, will was several years ago when uh, prior to the Crimea invasion, um, Ukraine suffered a number of severe cyber attacks and uh, they spilt over and there was a, a, a virus called NotPetya, which ran around the world and it brought down Maersk, the Danish shipping company, and Mondelez, which is an American food company, amongst many others. And ultimately, NotPetya was stopped not by the, the wonderful British armed forces or the Danish armed forces or you know US special forces, but by a couple of private sector companies, Microsoft being one of them. So large parts of our digital world are now key things that we need in order to have a functioning economy and a functioning polity are run by highly technical, highly expensive infrastructure that is operated by these private companies. And I think we have to coexist with that because they do a really, really good job of it. Uh, and so we need to think about what that relationship should be to these, these semi-state like things that sort of spill across borders. It's interesting, isn't it? In the in the 20th century, the answer to that uh, problem, which you which you identify, was for the state to ultimately, formally and informally, to co-opt technology mm -hmm. and to become the. If you look at the you know the developments in the 1940s, uh, look at the Manhattan Project. Yes, they were drawing on private institutions, universities, but these were government owned and government run um, projects same applies in 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 the UK but the state can't do that this time can it it can't say listen 
we are essentially nationalizing all of this technology and this is now essentially an infrastructure which we deem to be deem to be ours these private companies are not going to disappear i don't think they'll disappear and i think that for the infrastructure that is um that uh ship has has well sailed what we could do is we could say um these things are our essential infrastructure we're going to formally put higher obligations on you Understood. and you have to run them in different in different ways yeah yeah what what are the sort of industries that you'd identify in a, a, an old newspaper industry person yes. um, and it you know a lot resonated in the a lot resonated in this in this book but what are the industries that have been most uh, easily left behind do you think you look at the last 20 30 years well, I would think, you know, publishing uh, clearly and advertising uh, on the other side and commerce uh, have been the ones that really have been blindsided. And, and I think within that, we can add now entertainment. I mean, I, I read a fascinating um, number that this year, the US streaming companies like the Netflixes intend to spend $115 billion on commissioning new content. Now, that's great news for you and I, because I I don't want to go out every night. I don't mind watching a great Netflix series. Uh, but, but if you put that in context, you know, the BBC uh, at, at its peak had about $3 billion essentially of, uh, mm -hmm. for an entire budget to cover everything. So, you know, if you're, if you're an ABC or a, a Fox, you, you are really batting behind, uh, below, you know, sort of well below the scale of some of these, these firms. But, but the thing, the way that we also need to think about this is, this is driven by general purpose technologies. So these are technologies that can be applied across many, many industries. And, and you know, computing is one, and I identify three others, including new energies and things that we can do in biology and things we can do in manufacturing. What general purpose technologies tend to do is they, they, they can create new markets and create new consumer needs, and they create new industrial configurations. And so, Back at the turn of the 20th century, Henry Ford, who was by no means the first person to make cars, was able to apply the technologies of um, electrification to reorganize how cars were made. And they, met, they went from being artisanally produced by a bunch of craftspeople to those giant uh, you know, production lines in Red River and Dearborn and mm. places like that, dependent on the general purpose technology of electrification. And I think one of the harder things to predict is how will the new general purpose technologies reconfigure uh, within industries and across across industries and which ones will be able to survive by by shifting and changing what it is they do and which ones will go the way of you know, the steamship and the, and, and the blacksmith. Mm. So you, you, you describe the industrial age as being the age of globalization mm -hmm. so it's globalization which has made this phenomenon that you describe uh, possible but now the exponential age you say will be about relocalization what does that mean yeah it's it's quite uh, paradoxical i think because you know we're, we're familiar coming at the, the wrong end of this pandemic and uh, is, is is there ever the right end of a pandemic maybe we're at the right end of the pandemic <laughs> now but uh, at the uh, you know, we, we've been so vulnerable to supply chain shocks, everything from, you know, car manufacturers unable to ship cars because they can't get the chips they need through to, uh, you know, not being able to get sporting equipment. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the thing about these, these technologies is that um, a whole set of them are predisposed to a much more localization. So, for example, the technologies of renewable power, whether it is solar or wind, don't need us to move oil or natural gas across the globe. Uh, and they they can also be built at enormous grid scale, like the Pornsey off sea offshore wind farms, through to you or I having some domestic solar panels on our on our roofs. They can be decentralized. And and so you can imagine that that increasingly there is more ability to provide not just energy, but through high intensity vertical farms, but food as well, without needing to rely on really, really long supply chains. And that I think can start to put pressure on the general momentum to have very long supply chains and very, very sort of global relations. And in, in a sense, what that then does is it reinforces the 
promise of uh, people being able to live closer to their communities and the promise of political subsidiarity where people can make decisions in a more local way. Now, there are obviously many more moving parts to this as political issues and they're, 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 you know, and, and so on. And there is a response of the global uh, suppliers that the technologies themselves inherently do have this bias towards being able to get things done you know, within half a mile of where we live. Yeah. It, it also raises, we'll come on to climate change in a moment, but it raises really complex tensions, doesn't it? Which is, you know, if, you're, if, if you need gas or oil, you know, oil equivalent, um, you need oil for, uh, you know, to, to manage the transition, mm -hmm. new types of energy, then how we've kind of handled this in the last 10, 20 years is to get it from elsewhere and to essentially say, well, we're phasing out coal and we import a lot of a lot of energy and we you know import a lot of gas and the North Sea is fading out. But actually, the logic of your approach is then you, you would reinvest in the North Sea and try and do, do stuff which, you, which is closer to home, which lowers your shipping cost and also gives you some control over supply. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting this... Um you know, what we're learning this year. I was just going through my, my gas bills, actually, before I called you. They're four times higher, my energy bills, this yeah. December to December 2018. I mean, it's really, uh, it, it's quite uh, shocking. And, and I think one of the, 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 the problems we've run into here has been a that the debate around what the energy transition should look like ended up getting strangely polarised, right? So that you had people who really thought that renewables could go off and, and, and do a lot of this. And in the long term, I think that's absolutely right. And so weren't willing to countenance what transition needed to look like, which might have been natural gas and security of that, those supplies. And on the other hand, you had a lot of people who simply said, look, this renewable stuff is just kind of green eyed dreaming um, and we don't need to enga engage in it. And I think one and what that meant was that we had several years where we didn't have a a, a fruitful discussion about what the transition might look like. And, and in my book, I talk about the IEA, the International um, Energy Authority, who for 15 or 18 years used to come out with these forecasts of how much solar power would come on stream in the next year. And for 18 years or 15 years, they consistently got the number wildly, wildly wrong. They were always underestimating it. And, and part of the, the, the problem is that if you're sort of benchmark reference forecasts are that far off the mark. No one really knows how much to invest. No one really knows what transition gaps there might be. And I think where we've ended up, a lot of uncertainty for uh, in the energy markets has meant that there's been an underinvestment in what transition might end up looking like. And mm. you know, I think transition can happen much more quickly, but you still need to invest in it. And you, you think transition can happen quickly and you can get to a different kind of energy model. You're just, you're optimistic about the technology that's that's coming, the, the, I, the greening. I, you, what sort of time scale do you think? Well, I, I mean, I think that uh, we're already at a st in, in the four years where I was researching the book, solar power went from being um, you know, quite un uncompetitive in, in about 75 percent of the world to being the cheapest form of new electricity, electrical generation anywhere in the world, according to uh, Bloomberg's new energy finance. Uh, but of course, you still have to build it out. And then there are the issues of intermittency. There's lots of innovation in energy storage that is uh, that is coming along as well. But we have to understand that it's taken us 100 years to build the energy infrastructure we have today. and you know, certainly close to $100 trillion to get there. And there are some really smart people who I respect, like Vaclav Smil, who's an energy historian, um, who is has been looking at this for 50 years, who simply says, this is just going to take many more decades than you, you think. My pushback against that would be that the economics has fundamentally changed and the, the sort of consumer mood music has changed ac across the world. And we are getting much, much better at scaling things than we we ever have been. So while I don't think this can be done in one or two years, I don't think it'll take the hundred years that it took us to build this infrastructure in the uh, in the first case. When you're talking about relocalizing, I keep thinking at the moment about Europe and 
you know, getting beyond getting beyond Brexit and all that. Mm. But it just seems because you're, you're relocalizing can also mean regional, can't it? It can mean continent wide. Yeah. If we are moving beyond the age of overly long supply chains and we're trying to look for some form of security in terms of energy and supply of goods and and services, then Europe is well, has a bit of an opportunity, but also a, a political problem. And I was thinking of this about energy the other day. Uh, ben Judah and, um, on Twitter suggested, why can't Macron get out of the hole he's in politically at the moment, geopolitically, by suggesting that France will help lead on nuclear mm. and sharing technology with other countries in Europe. Now, it, the EU cannot be the mechanism for that for reasons we right. understand, because you, you essentially you have to you have to have Britain mm. there as a ma major economy that needs nuclear as well. So you have to liaise with the Brits. Some kind of transition plan also has to involve the Norwegians again for obvious reasons. You know, major um, major gas. producer, you know, gas producers. Yeah. So there is an opportunity there, but it's, a, it's another thing, a bit like defense, where Europe still very, very prosperous. This great you know, cult, home of culture, all the rest of it, and 500 million people, but it can't sort out a coordinated energy policy or a security policy or a defense policy. I, I mean, it may have a, a yeah, just have the, the, the exactly the right scale to deal with uh, Google and Facebook, but the wrong scale to deal with the issues that you uh, you're talking about here. But there are other actors uh, that we should we should think about. So um, one of the things that I've been fascinated with has been how uh, private sector uh, companies have really played a role in, in, in the part of the energy transition. Now, the, the reason solar power is cheap right now is mm. for a number, a number of things, but the actions of the German government to uh, subsidize solar in the 90s, which essentially allowed it to get to scale, uh, are really key to solar power being cheap today. But outside of that, what we see is an amazing set of innovation in areas like um, uh, nuclear fusion, not just nuclear fission, uh, which is now being done by the private sector rather than the public sector. Uh, and I think we can look at the lessons of SpaceX, which uh, has gone off and said, look, we've built on the platform of NASA, and we're now doing this dozens, hundreds of times cheaper than the state was ever able to do. So even when we look at things like energy, uh, there are there's obviously tried and tested technology, nuclear technology in in France, but there are also a number of startups, both in in fusion, which we've never successfully got to work mm -hmm. even in the lab, um, and in fission, where I think we might be able to find routes from the private sector. But the block, particularly for fission, will come from, you know, the fear of the meltdown and the, the you know the regulatory and safety requirements there. Yeah. It's interesting, Brian Cox, Professor Brian Cox, who's been who's been on this show. When I asked him about space exploration, the next stage of the space race, mm. I anticipated just simply having watched his programs and talked to him before that that he would want some kind of reinvention of the the NASA model. Mm. But actually, no. He says, look at what's happening in the private sector. It's being powered that way. In a way, the last thing you would want, considering the dysfunction of the of the U.S. Uh, right federal state is for is for it to claim more of uh, you know more more responsibility and try and organize things centrally so there's a, a there's a lot happening there that's positive in the private sector do you think on this you know the the, the exponential age and uh, we're talking about your book exponential how accelerating technology is leaving us behind and what to do to do about it mm. we've had points in, in in human development where people have been skeptical of technological change and worried about it, whether it's the Luddites, the Industrial Revolution. Is, are we right to be worried about this or is there really nothing we can do to slow or manage the, um, the pace of change? I think there's lots we can do to manage, uh, manage the pace, but that requires uh, agency and stepping up and showing up. Uh, and one of the things I think that we're having to contend with uh, is that over the last 30, 40 years, we've create, allowed a, a narrative, a media narrative to emerge that somehow the technology 
uh, appears with these brilliant men in their black polo necks over in Silicon Valley. And if we're not, if we don't kowtow to them, we won't get our technologies. And that's not the case. Uh, I think that it's, we've got the talent, not just in the UK, but in many, many parts of the world. We also know how to build them. And I think more of us need to get involved in engaging with what the potentials can be because it's through that that we start to understand what the drawbacks might be and where we bring the value of history and perspective to and which i think has been critically missing in the technology industry that got us uh to, you know that has got us to where we are today and the one thing i should say about the luddites is that i have a lot of sympathy for the luddites i mean the luddites argument was well look if you're going to bring these machines in we should share in some of the upside uh, and as opposed to saying, let's not have the machines at all. And, and in a way they were, they were right because in the hundred or so years um, after the introduction of this kind of machinery in the British economy, GDP growth far outpaced worker wage growth. Uh, what Frederick Engels uh, identified and was later called the Engels pause. And British workers did very poorly for about a hundred years until the 1920s when there were some reforms and they caught up. And, and I think there are good reasons for us to be Luddites, which is to say this technology will improve productivity. Let's all make sure we get a fair share of it. Final question. What about the democracy problem? We've seen the way in which technology has shaped and reshaped politics in the last 10, 15 years in terms yeah. of political communication, the opportunities it's, it's given certain politicians. There's a there is a problem here. It really is the exponential gap, isn't it? Mm. Which is that, and I remember observing this about the, the the financial industry in the aftermath of the the financial crisis in two thousand and eight. It seemed obvious to me that something had shifted. That essentially it was as though we worked for the banks right. rather than, rather than them working for us and serving us. And there's a danger for the big technology firms that we are of their creatures rather than them being accountable to us and doing what we want, which gets you know, it's right at the heart of what Teddy Roosevelt thought about Standard Oil or excessive concentrations of interest, interest in the early 20th century. It doesn't sound from what you're saying as, th as though that is going to, that gap is going to shrink anytime soon. Well, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to shift it without taking specific actions and the, the trouble with the, the the democratic question is that a lot of it uh, is very very slow burn because it's about citizens ability to resist misinformation and disinformation it's about people's willingness to um, open up to other points of view as well and there are some interventions we can make on around the platforms in terms of making sure that they are much more transparent uh, about what's going on, on on their networks but but i think there are other non-technological uh, approaches, which I don't really get a chance to touch on in, in, in the book. Um, I think about the Irish referendum on abortion uh, a couple of years ago, which was a really contentious issue, but a referendum that went through, was well run, and people largely bought in to the, to the result. But what got them there was a process of deliberative democracy where citizens were engaged over several days in these citizen juries. And we're starting to see citizen juries emerge as a way of identifying what the real issues are without the polarization that, that we're all sort of uh, uh, at risk of on, on Twitter and, and Facebook. And, and I think that those could be mechanisms that can work. I was really pleased to see that the city of Paris in the last year started to establish permanent citizen juries to explore key issues that the city will, will face over the next years. I would love to see things like that widen um, in, in their use in the UK. That is not to minimise the House of Commons. It's about throwing a new kind of light on what the real issues are and where what citizens care about. So, and that's a non-technological solution, I think, that can help us. So I want to thank you, Azim Azar, your book, Exponential, How Accelerating Technology is Leaving Us Behind and What to Do About It. Thank you for joining us today. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button below. You may be listening to this on the Reaction podcast as well, which features the best of our conversations from the week. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction itself, the details are below. You get my weekly newsletter on politics, Maggie Pagano, on business and lots more beside. But until next time, thank you very much for listening.